appropriately for a module on glaciers. It's getting extremely cold in this shed, so I've had to put my hat and coat on for today's lecture, uh, which is appropriate because one of the things we're talking about over these sessions is how temperature is an important control on glacial processes and the movement of glaciers. Remember A in Glenn's flow law? We're going to talk shortly about friction at the base of a glacier with sliding and temperature controls the availability of water and whether water is liquid or frozen. So um, if you wonder why I'm dressed up, uh, you can think it's because I'm going to be talking about temperature. So over, the, uh, well, over this session we've been talking about glacier, uh, glacier motion. You know now that glaciers move by three main mechanisms, internal deformation, basal sliding and deformation of the substrate. And you know that these movements are controlled by force being applied to the glacier. Movement is a response to an applied force. We call the movement strain. And you know the relationships between stress and strain. You know Glenn's flow law, for example, which is the relationship between stress, um, shear stress and strain. And you know the shear stress equation, tau equals rho gh sine alpha. So you're beginning to get your head around some of these basic uh, fundamental points that, that enable us to understand how glaciers move and how glaciers uh, behave. Last time we looked a little bit more at internal deformation uh, and we talked about the fact that there are a variety of different processes by which creep can occur, partly related to the, um, the, the physical structure, the, the atomic structure of ice. We talked about Glenn's flow or the shear stress equation. And I left you last time thinking about the vertical creep profile, the vertical stress profile, vertical strain profile, and the vertical velocity profile. We've now had a look at how the answers to those uh, come out. So you're beginning, I hope, to feel confident that you can understand how, how movement uh, is working. So we've said a little bit about creep or internal deformation, and I want to move on now to say a little bit about sliding. Now, sliding at the base of the glacier is driven again by applied forces. So you need to remember, when we have, when we have gravity working vertically through a surface, we have a normal stress, which doesn't lead to any movement sideways. It's a compressive vertical stress at right angles to a surface. That's a normal stress. So vertical normal stress, me pushing down onto the bench, also a normal stress if I'm pushing at right angles to the surface here, that's normal to the surface. A shear stress is a stress parallel to the surface, or a stress parallel to a surface like that. What's going to make this glacier slide, or the base of the glacier slide across the substrate, is a shear component to the stress. You already know, believe it or not, how to work out that shear stress if we have a glacier resting on top of this bed and we have a thickness of glacier ice and we have a surface gradient, well you can calculate throughout the thickness of the glacier, you can calculate the shear stress at each level, because that's what you were doing in that last exercise, where the shear stress at each, each level is the, the weight of ice, the overburden of ice, governed by H, multiplied by the sign of that gradient, and it increases with depth through the glacier, all the way to the base, and the shear stress applying at that interface there, we call the basal shear stress, simply because it's a shear stress at the base of the glacier. And the basal shear stress, tau b, it's often given as tau b, well, that's the stress which is driving that horizontal movement. And that then brings us back to the idea of, well, the movement is going to occur if the shear stress is sufficient to overcome the strength or resistance in, in the system, which is the friction at the bed. And the friction at the bed might be derived from the fact that the glacier is frozen to the bed in a, in a cold-based situation, or it might be due to roughness of the base of the glacier, debris within the glacier, or roughnesses on the, um, on the surface of the substrate. If we have a nice, smooth, hard, well-lubricated surface there, sliding will be easy and you won't need a lot of shear stress. If you have a rough, sticky, frozen surface, then it's going to be harder you're going to need a greater amount of shear stress to overcome uh, the strength or the friction and to initiate movement. So I, I often, in, in the lecture rooms, when we used to do these sessions indoors, I used to bring in what was, I think it was called the Whammo Slip and Slide Surf Rider. It's a long rubber sheet and you lubricate, with, lubricate it with water and you take a small person, you can slide them along this whammo slip and, slip and slide and it demonstrates very well how, how bodies will slide over a, a smooth lubricated surface. Likewise here, sliding is easy. However, sliding isn't easy if we have a rough surface. And in glaciers, well, 
if you imagine a landscape and you imagine the base of a glacier, we don't have one smooth surface sliding over another smooth surface. At all sorts of different scales, we have roughnesses. We have roughnesses at the scale of irregularities in the, in the surface of the, of the substrate, and we have roughness in the form of pebbles or boulders or rocks sticking out of the base of the glacier. We have roughnesses in the forms of hills, valleys, mountains. Landscapes aren't smooth glassy surfaces really for, for glaciers to ride over, they're rough surfaces. So the question is, how do glaciers overcome roughnesses in order to slide across their substrate? Here's a few pictures to illustrate what I mean about that. The first picture here is uh, a, a, a close-up of glacier ice sliding over bedrock at the Russell Glacier in, in, in Greenland. And this is kind of the fairy tale picture I took. I remember taking this photograph because it was relatively unusual to see a situation such as this where there's a fairly smooth rock surface with a fairly smooth glacier bottom with no debris in it just sliding across that rock surface. In some environments where you have lots of melting at the base of the glacier, that might be a common situation, but certainly in lots of ice sheet margins um, and certainly lots of uh, locations, um, you'll have debris in the base of the ice, you'll have a rougher or, or a more deformable substrate and the situation won't be that simple. Where the, sim where the situation is simple like that, and this next picture illustrates the kinds of outcomes that you can, can get. A, a smooth rock surface there which has been uh, overridden uh, by a glacier. There's some, some toes for scale at the top of the picture there. Uh, this, this bit of rock has been overridden by a glacier and the glacier riding over it has, has been polishing and striating um, that rock as it has slidden over it. But then moving on to the next picture, well, that's a, that's a picture of West Greenland just above the Arctic Circle, and very similar geomorphology, in fact, to what you might be familiar with in the northwest parts of the, the UK, west coast of Scotland, because the geology is similar and the, the, um, the geomorphic processes that have affected it are similar. But this is the kind of landscape over which the Greenland ice sheet in this area has been advancing and retreating and sliding across. It's a landscape of aerial scouring. There's lots of polishing, lots of striations, uh, lots of erosion of the landscape by processes such as abrasion. So there's evidence of here of the glaciers having been sliding over the surface. But how do you slide over a rough surface such as that? And this next picture, well again we're close up of the, the base of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, there's a, a box of biscuits, actually a box of Nairn's oat cakes for scale there in the, in, in the picture. But we're looking at a very rough bed, a very rough substrate underneath the glacier, and the base of the glacier is full of rocks, full of debris. In fact, it's difficult to work out where the base of the glacier and the top of the frozen substrate is, but it's certainly not a smooth, friction-free surface over which surface can uh, occur. So in rough surface situations like this, at all sorts of different scales, we need another mechanism for glaciers to overcome that surface roughness and to accomplish what we've simplistically been, call, been calling sliding. It's all very well to say things can slide, but how does sliding work if you have an obstacle preventing you from sliding? Well, there are two processes that I want to talk about. Regulation and enhanced basal creep. And those are two of the mechanisms by which glaciers can overcome roughness and obstacles and accomplish sliding at the glacier bed. So let's talk first of all about the process of regulation slip. Regulation, the gelation relates to freezing, the re implies that we're melting and then we're refreezing regulation processes. Now the idea here is that if we have a smooth surface with ice resting on a smooth bedrock surface, it's relatively easy to understand that a shear stress is going to lead to movement of the ice across that surface. By contrast, if we have an obstacle or a roughness, some kind of protuberance in that bed, well, how is the ice going to overcome that? Well, the way that it overcomes it is that on the upstream side of that bump, because the ice is pushing against it, that shear stress is driving it against that obstacle, there's a, a, a high stress zone on the upstream side of the bump, and there's a lower stress zone on the downstream side of the bump. 
the melting temperature of ice depends partly on the pressure. So if you're close to the melting point, an increase in pressure is going to lead to melting of the ice. So in this high pressure zone, if the ice is close to the melting point, we're likely to get melting occurring. Because there's a pressure gradient from a high pressure zone here to a low pressure zone there, that melting is likely to be accompanied by water flow around the obstacle towards the downstream side. On the downstream side, we have a lower pressure zone because the ice is pulling away in that direction. And in that lower pressure zone, the melting point changes again. And this water at zero degrees, say, at that, at that melting point, at that melting freezing point temperature, at this pressure, that water is going to freeze again. It's going to refreeze. So at the melting point temperature across the bed, high pressure there leads to melting, pressure gradient leads to water flow around the obstacle, low pressure leads to refreezing. We're not changing the temperatures, we're changing the pressures. So that's part one of the, the regelation process. The ice is making its way around the obstacle by melting, flowing around as water and refreezing on the downstream side. That sounds great, that sounds straightforward. The problem is, the process of melting here requires energy. That phase change requires latent heat. And so that is drawing heat out of the surrounding ice and potentially out of the surrounding rock, just to generate, just to maintain that process of melting. So eventually, that would cool the area down and we'd get too cold for the pressure increase to actually allow melting to occur. So that could stop the, the process, it could lead to a, a, an on-off, if you like, process of, of, um, uh, of, of melting water flow and refreezing. However, if this obstacle is small enough, we can overcome that problem, because on the downstream side of the bump, where, that, where the refreezing occurs, that results in a release of heat into the environment, including release of heat back into and through the obstacle, to provide the energy which is being required on this side to keep that melting happening. So in a small obstacle situation, if we're looking at something of millimetres, centimetres, or maybe even tens of centimetres across, we might set up a sustainable continuing process of melting, water flow, refreezing, heat supply, regulation ongoing. If the obstacle is too big, so instead of this being a few centimetres across, we talk about it being a metre or, or more across, then we're not going to be able to transmit the heat back through the rock to supply the melting on the upstream side. So regulation typically works for small obstacles. But what if we have a big obstacle then? So what's the second process we were talking about? Uh, enhanced basal creep. How does that one work for bigger obstacles. Enhanced basal creep. What's that? Well, let's redraw this and make everything make everything neat again. So enhanced basal creep. And here we're talking about a much bigger bedrock obstacle, but we're still trying to move the ice across it. Well, we're talking about creep, and you already know a little bit about creep, because you know that E equals A times tau to the N. The creep is proportional to the, the, str the stress which is being applied. The strain is proportional to the, an, ex an exponent of the applied stress. When we were talking about regulation, we already made the point that this is a higher stress zone because ice is moving in that direction and counting the obstacle so we have a higher stress zone here and a lower stress zone there. So thinking now not so much about sliding at this interface but thinking about movement within this ice in the lower layers around the, the, the kind of amplitude of that, um, that obstacle, what's happening to the creep rate there because we here have an enhanced stress close to the base an enhanced basal stress. Stress is going to generate our creep. So if we have an enhanced basal stress, we also have enhanced basal creep. So because of the stress being induced by large scale obstacles at the bed, we get more creep occurring. 
the bigger the obstacle, the bigger the stress enhancement, so the ice is able to deform more effectively around and over large obstacles at the bed because of this enhanced basal creep. Enhanced basal creep works better at large obstacle sizes, not small obstacle sizes, so between the two of them, the regulation works well for small obstacles, enhanced basal creep works well for big obstacles, but there's an area just in here between those two size grades, typically people often say it's around about a, a, a metre or so. Uh, so I, I tend to think of an anti-tank trap, big concrete block that would, uh, um, big concrete block that would, would stop a World War II tank on the on the beaches. That's the kind of obstacle size that is also going to be difficult for glaciers to overcome because they can't overcome them very well by regulation. They're not big enough for them to overcome them by enhanced basal creep. And so there's what's sometimes referred to as a, a critical obstacle size, a critical obstacle size that isn't suitable for either of those mechanisms. But broadly speaking, our question was how do glasses overcome roughness at the bed in order to slide across the bed? Well, read up on regulation and enhanced basal creep uh, as those two main mechanisms. I'm going to go, I'm going to go get warm. <laughs>